right, good morning, Three Circle. Great to be with you guys today. We've got all of our campuses joining us right now. And before we dive into the hymn that we're going to do today, because we're in the middle of a hymns series, let me just give you an update on what's going on at all of our campuses. You know, we're one church with several locations, and every one of our campuses have great things going on. Uh, you will find that we are right now not only in the hymn series, we're also in the middle of an initiative, the, uh, the Glory and Good Initiative, where we are doing some financial things together so that we can touch every single campus that we have. Every campus has needs, and it's all good things. It's good things. Our Daphne campus, uh, there are Sundays, there are weekends where people have to sit out in the lobby to look through the door, uh, to look into the worship center. There's that many people coming, so we've got to build new facilities there that we're excited about. At our Thomasville campus, uh, we are reaching more people than we ever have right now, and we were recently able to purchase a building in Thomasville on the main highway there that we're about to start remodeling. We're very excited about that. In Midtown, you know, just over the past year, we were able to remodel the gym completely, and, and then we were able to bring on other staff members, other family ministry staff that are having a massive impact, not only on what happens on the weekends, but after school programs and et cetera. It's just been uh, absolutely incredible. Then our Robertsdale campus, our youngest campus, if you will, uh, man, they're in two gatherings at the high school now. And just last weekend, we had one of our biggest weekends we've ever had in Robertsdale. And so we see God doing great things there. We were able to recently purchase property in Robertsdale where we will build uh, soon. And what we're going to do is on Easter Sunday, and Robertsdale is with us right now joining us in Robertsdale. They're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday morning. They're going to have a sunrise gathering on their new property for the first time. How about that? It's going to be awesome. Yep. So... We're excited about that, and that brings me to Fairhope. As you know, especially uh, certain times on a Sunday, we have a lot of folks here, man, and we are always looking at how can we how can we reach as many people as we can and be able to still get on and off of our property and all of those issues that we have. Again, good problems to have. There's still problems. We got to figure it out, and so we've looked at things that we can do. And so we are excited about something that we're going to launch right after Easter here. It's unique. It's something that we're going to do here. We're excited about it. We're going to launch Thursday night gatherings at Three Circle Church Fairhope Campus. Now, yeah, we're pumped about that. And we're hoping about 500 of you are too. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, now that's going to do several things. First of all, Thursday nights will begin that what's going to happen is that will start our weekend. So the weekends at Three Circle will start with Thursday then, which we're excited about. What that's going to do is a lot of people, frankly, cannot do the weekend. They work. We've heard this for years. And diff different times of year with families and kids and all of that. So there's going to be a Thursday worship option for people. But that's also going to do is it's going to enable us, because we simply can't do more on Sunday, is it's going to enable us to create some space uh, for people. So I can't tell you how excited we are about that. We hope that you'll tell your friends. We hope that you will take advantage of it potentially. And let's see what God does with that, all right? So every campus, God's doing great things. So we can just thank him for that, right? God is good. We're grateful. And we're excited about all of it. Uh, I'm pretty pumped to be opening the Bible right now. You know, I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. And so we're not doing the hymn series to learn these hymns, though they're fun and beautiful and amazing. We're, we're wanting to see what's the biblical foundation that these hymns were written on, that, were, that they were built on, if you will. And today, Blessed Assurance. How many of you, this is one of your favorite hymns? You've heard this one your whole life, maybe. Yeah, a lot of us and uh, online at all of our campuses in the same way. It was written by Fanny Crosby in the 1800s. She was blind from her childhood, but she was a prolific lyricist. She wrote tons of songs. She wrote so many hymns that the hymn book makers of her day decided that it wasn't looking good for one author to have so many hymns in the book. And also, unfortunately, uh, at, during that time, women were not, frankly, treated the way they should have been treated, with the respect they should have been given. So they thought, not only is it bad to have so many songs coming from one person, but it's a woman. And that, oh man, right? So, the, so you know what Fanny did, because she was brilliant? Is she said, you know what? I'll just write using a different name. So she started using pseudonyms, all right? She started you know, calling herself other things and writing the songs to get them in there. And she just kept writing. And I love, boy, wouldn't you love to meet her, right? <laughs> Nothing could stop her and... So one day, the brilliant Fanny Crosby goes to a friend's house who is having an organ installed at her house, and she's a musician. And she plays for Fanny this new piece of music that she had. And she looks at 
her and she says, what do you think that says? That piece of music I just played, what does it say? And without missing a beat, famously, she said to her, it says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. How about that? That's what happens when you're that gifted, you can sneeze and a great song comes out. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so we have, uh, we have blessed assurance today. Now, what is that song built on? Blessed assurance, that word, assurance. Jesus is mine. Now, here's what I think, what I know, what I've experienced is that Christians often will struggle with assurance of their salvation. I bet you have. I bet every one of us have at some point. I think it's one of the common attacks of our enemy. I think our own flesh also gets away from us on this. And I think being assured, like answering the question, how do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know I'm in the faith? How, because it's pretty, that's a pretty big one, isn't it? You don't want to get that one wrong. And so what I want to do today, I am hoping two things. I hope that every believer hearing this will be secured in their salvation, that you will be encouraged, and that encouragement from God's word will embolden you and give you joy. That, I'm hoping for that. Secondly, I'm hoping that, that if you're not a believer, that this will clear that up too, that you'll leave going, you know what, no ambiguity, no ambiguity here, I'm not a believer. I need to know Jesus. I hope those two things will happen today. So let's dive into the word of God. The first thing I want you to know when it comes to knowing you're a Christian, God wants you to know. God wants us to have assurance of our salvation. And I'm going to show you today that there is a book in the Bible written by a famous guy in the Bible that was written for this purpose. John, the great John, the one that went all the way to the cross with Jesus. In one of his books in the New Testament, 1 John, he wrote that book for people who were struggling with assurance of their salvation. In fact, uh, look what he wrote, 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe. So who does, who's, who's 1 John written to? Those who believe. So he wrote it for Christians. In the name of the Son of God, and here's why. That you, that's why. That you may know. You might, today's a great day to have your pen out. This is a note-taken, circling day, okay? So you wanna, you wanna go... Those who believe, that's, that's who it was written to, and then that you may know. You might want to underline or circle that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he wrote. So if you, from here on out, because even though we're going to do this today, you will still struggle with assurance of your salvation at times. And when you do, I just encourage you, read 1 John. Just go right to 1 John and read it again. Because he wrote this, one of the few books in the Bible where the writer tells you the one big thing he wrote it for is for believers to know that they have eternal life. Let me tell you why this is important. When I, when I got married, Nan and I, you know, she grew up in small town north of Mobile, and I grew up in a small town uh, west of Mobile over in Mississippi. So we both grew up small towns, and uh, I grew up in the booming metropolis of Hurley, Mississippi. We had this beautiful one light, you know, when you came through there, and a couple of gas stations and a cornfield. You know what I mean? It's kind of that kind of place. And Nan, same way. So then we, we end up going to college in the booming metropolis of Mobile, Alabama, which was the big city for us. But then we got married, and out of college, we went to Atlanta. Now, Atlanta's for real, okay? Like, that's a for real metropolis, okay? Lots of traffic and all that. And here's the thing. We'll let you in on a little something about me. I am directionally challenged, and it's not it's bad, okay? GPS has changed my life. The iPhone's changed my life. I used to get lost all the time. And, and, I, and my wife, Nan, she's great with directions, okay? And it's okay. For you guys in here that can't admit when your wife's better, it's because you're insecure. Get over it, all right? So I was more than willing to go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get lost. And so when I got to Atlanta, I didn't, it was the early 2000s. I did not have an iPhone. I did not have GPS and all that. You know what I had to depend on? These things right here. I had to depend on road signs. And you know what? It's bad for a guy. Like, I got a short attention span, man. And I start thinking about things like, oh, a squirrel, you know what I mean? And, and I would miss the road signs. So I had to train myself to look at the road signs. I, would, I was notorious for driving right by our exit. And my wife, it became so fun for her, she would know. She's like, he's driving by the exit. We'd get on down the road and she'd go, where are we going? You got, got some kind of surprise for me? I'd say, what do you mean? She said, well, you drove by our exit. You know, this happened all the time. She stopped correcting me. She was just like, you know what? Hey, wherever we're going, I'm excited about it. And when you miss your exit in Atlanta, you got to go a while to get back to it. You know what I mean? So I had to learn to look for the road signs. And let me tell you why this matters. Because 1 John is going to give you three big road signs to tell you that you're on the right road. Because there is nothing more 
uh, unsettling than not knowing that you're going the right way. You ever been on one of those roads and you're like, something, give me something, a sign, something to tell me, yes, I'm going the right direction. And so John doesn't want you meandering through your Christian life. He gives you signs. I'm going to give you three big ones today that you need to see in your life to go, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, because when you have assurance and he wants you to, you can have joy, you can be confident, you can sleep like a baby at night. That's what I hope today for every Christian, that tonight, sleepy time. Because you are so assured of your salvation, but you got to look for the road signs. Write it down. There are biblical road signs that show us that we're on the right road and we're going the right direction. Now, direction's important because we're not talking perfection. We're talking direction. And that's what I want to help you with today. So let's dive into the Bible now. Let's dive into the Word of God. And the first road sign you're going to see, and I do believe that they work this way. By the way, this is not like many theologians have looked at 1 John. I'm, I'm pulling from years of material that I've heard others, professors, others teach. So if, 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 you, if you're a Bible guy, you're going to end up going to 1 John and kind of break them out this way. So I'm not the first guy to look at this and see these road signs, okay? So I'm just telling you things that many years of theologians and experts and preachers have seen here. And the first one is theological. You need to see the theological roadmap. What do you believe? That's first. And I do believe that the three are going to work in succession, that they're going to flow into each other. And you need to see all three if you're a Christian. But the first one is, what do I believe theologically? Theological. What do I believe about God? Okay? C.S. Lewis says the most important thing. A.W. Tozer says what you think about God is the most important thing. These great writers all came to that place. There's nothing more important. What do you believe about God? What do you believe specifically about Jesus? So let's go to 1 John 5, 10 through 12. And again, we're, we're going to come straight from 1 John today. Here's what he says. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony. Remember, get your pen ready at all of our campuses online and here today to underline some things. Whoever believes, I'd, I'd circle believes. Greek word idea there is pestuo. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Ooh, there's a word, testimony. Back in my church growing up, we had testimony time. On Sunday nights is when they did it. Because on Sunday nights, they would take a microphone and let it be passed around the church. Let me tell you what, that's one of the most exciting times in the world. When you pass a microphone around. You saw them wave it down, bring me that microphone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. start having some church and as a young guy man we knew who we knew who was a every weaker you know what I mean we kind of knew it was coming here we go here we go <laughs> testimony time what is the testimony we know what testimony is when someone gives an account this is what we're talking about and the Bible says here that real Christians who believe theologically we believe about Jesus, the correct things that the Bible teaches us, we have a new testimony. We, we have that testimony that God gave us is now what we believe about Jesus. That's what it's saying. Now watch, whoever does not believe God has made him a liar. Like if you don't believe what God tells you about Jesus, then you're saying, well, he's lying. He's not telling the truth. Watch this. Because he has not believed in the testimony. What testimony? Watch this. What the Bible says about Jesus is what testimony means right there. What God has told us about Jesus is the testimony that we must believe. That God has borne concerning his son. So who gave us the testimony? God. God bore this testimony to us. This is who he is. Verse 11. And this is the testimony. That God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Now what kind of life is it talking about? Remember, this is important. It's talking about spiritual life. We have physical life and spiritual life. Go back to the Garden of Eden. God said, you eat of the fruit of that tree that I told you not to eat of and you will die. But then if you're reading your Bible, you realize, boom, they take a bite out of the fruit and they're still standing there. And you go, whoa, I thought they were going to die. They did die. Immediately, they died spiritually. They continue to live physically. This is why when Jesus came, 
He said you have to be born to have eternal life twice. You have to be born physically, but you also have to be born, what? Spiritually, because you're born dead spiritually. You're not brought to life until Jesus brings you to life. That's what it's talking about there. If you have Jesus, then you have life, spiritual life, that he has given you. So what do we see in these verses? That this is, this is our first big road sign we're looking at. It's theological in nature. It's what we believe. And this is what it means. We can have assurance if we believe in Jesus, but this is important, an addendum, if you will, as revealed in the Bible. Because there's lots of people that believe lots of things about Jesus. If you say today, I believe Jesus is real and that he existed, then you have joined the demons because they believe that. Also, you've joined most atheists in the world because anyone who has any kind of intelligence will not deny the existence of a man named Jesus because there's just too much history. There's mountains of history. Like There was a guy named Jesus who lived where, where he lived. Like There's just no doubt. Most of them will even admit the guy was crucified because there's just too much information. There's no doubt. There's a guy named Jesus who lived. So tipping your hat to his existence is not what he's talking about when it says believe here. No, no, it's clear. What he's talking about is you believing in the testimony of God about his son. And where do you find that testimony? This is why, and listen, all the cool kids in the evangelical world are famously doing this right now. But when you hear people begin to say that we don't need the Bible, we just need to believe that this, no, that's where you find the truth about Jesus. He has given us his word. This is the testimony about Jesus. One of the most dangerous things in the world would be for us to go, I don't know about the validity or the authority of God's word. Folks, you've never seen a slippier slope than that. That's the slippiest, slippery, slippiest. Slippy, slippy. It don't get any more slippy than that. Slimy slippy, okay? That's what's happening there. That thing just runs you right off the cliff. We find the testimony about Jesus in God's word. Pestuo is the idea. Pestuo means to sit in. That's what kind of belief. It's not a tipping of your hat to existence. It's I believe what God has said about Jesus and I will now sit in it, meaning it holds my life. I so hang my life on what God has said about Jesus that if it fails, I'm a fool. That's what Paul said. Paul's like, I have put everything to the middle of the table on Jesus so much so I am a fool. I am wretched. The whole world should pity me if it's not true. But then he quickly says, oh, but it is true. It is true. And that's why I'm hanging my hat on the hook of Jesus. That's why the door hinge of my life is swinging on Jesus. It's why everything we talk about is Jesus. Because we believe, watch, the testimony about him. That means the chairs you're sitting in right now, you trusted the weight of your body to the chair. And just for fun, we've got a couple that will collapse at any moment. You don't know which one it is. We did this in Robertsdale for you guys, Midtown, every, I'm just kidding. We did, we, we would never do something like that. I would, but our staff won't let me. But when you came in, you looked at that chair and you said, I'm going to trust my weight of my physical body to this chair to hold me up. And real Christians have said, I'm going to trust the spiritual weight of my life on the spiritual truth of Jesus and who he is. I got everything I got on that. Eternity's on that. Everything I have is on who Jesus is. Now, what specifically John actually gives us, again, we're looking for the road signs. We're riding down the road. I don't know if I'm on the road. Boom, there it is. It reminds me that I am. What specific things must we believe about Jesus? Here's three big theological ideas that John gives us. So I'm trying to keep us on track with just him because he said, I'm, I'm telling you these things so you can know. And the first one is we must believe he's the Messiah because that's what God said about him which means you cannot ditch the Old Testament. You cannot do that. You must root, which is what the apostles did, it's what Jesus did. You must root your New Testament in the Old Testament. They, they, they're hinging together, y'all. The idea that we're going to leave the Old Testament because the New Testament puts God in a better mood. 
the Old Testament makes us nervous. No, 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 no. Now, now we're, again, we're on that slippery slope, my friends. No, we need to see. So the Old Testament tells us a promise. God is sending a Messiah. Here's what he's going to look like. Here's, what, here's how they're going to kill him. Here's how all of this is going to happen. Here's how this is going to go. And all real Christians say, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Because God said he was, we believe the testimony of God about his son. That's why John says in verse 22 of chapter 2, who is the liar, the ones making God a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Christ means Messiah. So we Christians bury our faith both in the New and the Old Testament, the whole counsel of the Word of God. He even compares that. He says this is not just like neutral, it's antichrist. And watch this. This person denies the Father and the Son. You're denying God when you deny Jesus because Jesus is God the Son. That's not all, though. Christians don't just believe he's the fulfillment of the Old Testament Messiah. We also believe that Jesus is God himself. Believers, you should see that road sign. We're just talking about what you believe about him. Do you believe that he's God? Because if you believe God created Jesus on Christmas with O Holy Night being sung in the background, then, then that's not Christianity. It's something else. Jesus became a human at the incarnation in Bethlehem, but he had always been God, the Son. He was the eternal Son of God who became a man. He did not stop being God. He did not simply cut himself in half and become part man, part God. No, we believe that he is fully God, fully divine. We'll go back to our verses in the original passage, 1 John 5 10, uh, look what it says. It says, whoever believes in the Son of God, capital S, deity. We believe as Christians that Jesus is God. By the way, one of the reasons, and it's real hard to justify this, like you can't believe Jesus was a good man and not believe he was God. I believe that. Let me tell you why. Because he said all the time he was God. C.S. Lewis pointed this out. He's a pretty smart guy. C.S. Lewis would forget more during his morning tea than I learn in a lifetime, all right? But I'm the guy you're stuck with up here, okay? So I'll just quote C.S. Lewis for you. But C.S. Lewis said, you just got some choices about Jesus. You can't, just, you can't just blow him off. He's either crazy, because only crazy guy talks like that, or he wasn't crazy. Like, he was fully in his mind. That makes him a horrific deceiver and liar. That makes him an arrogant liar. Or, or he did it all normal and his, his followers made it all up. Maybe his disciples made the whole story up. And that doesn't explain how they all went to horrific deaths for him. Who would do that for a lie they made up? I mean, I might make up a story. You come at me with the torch and the nails and the whips and the lions, and I'm like, I was kidding. It was a joke. They didn't do that. No, they were bold. Peter looked at the same bunch that he was scared to death of earlier, and he looked at them after seeing the resurrected Christ, and he's like, I, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want to me, but I'll tell you this. You put me back out in the street, and I'll be preaching this gospel again, and the only way you'll stop me is to kill me because I saw him dead and then alive. Right? So they believed it. The Son of God, that testimony but Christians don't just believe that Jesus is fully God this is what we must believe it's a road sign right he's also fully human we believe he's the God man not half God half man fully human and John points out this is a major road sign you're gonna you've taken a wrong road if you start either believing that he's not God he's only man but also if you believe he's not man and only God well you don't have Jesus anymore not the Jesus of the Bible in fact, he points it out in 1 John 4, 2. He says, by this, so he keeps giving you road sign. Here's another road sign. By this you know. You might want to circle that. Oh, here's another one. When he says that, go, oop, there's another road sign. Those things I was, I was looking for in Atlanta all the time. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So John's piecing together a road map for you 
So that when you're driving down the road and you start doubting and you go, I don't know, man. Am I really? You go, oh, well, I believe that. I believe the testimony about Jesus, that he's the Messiah. Absolutely. When I read the Old Testament, well, that's Jesus and that's Jesus and that's Jesus. Okay. And, and you know what? I believe, I believe that. I believe that he's God. I don't believe Jesus is just a man. Like, I believe everything in me. I, I know he is God. And then I also know he was a real human. I know that. I believe that. I believe he's the God man. Then, you, then, then guess what? Sleep like a baby. Assurance. Because you're on that road. You don't believe that stuff without, without the Holy Spirit bringing you there. You didn't just come up with that on your own. Because, by the way, that's a crazy story to believe, isn't it? Crucified, the people that got crucified didn't go walking around after that. You don't lay in a tomb for three days and, 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 and be alive. We believe that stuff. We believe the testimony, and that testimony is in us. But it's not just theological, it's also moral. And these, they, they move in succession. They, they come into one another. It's a sequence here. Moral. And this is how you behave and how you live. We can have assurance if we begin to see changes in our behavior and our daily life. So as you're riding down the road of your life and faith, you go, okay, I see the theological road signs, but then the next one that will always be there. And he's going to tell you, it, it's not a, an option. These are not optional. These road signs... If you don't see them, you're not on the road. If you don't see all of them. And it's moral. Am I changing? Now, this is important. Direction, not perfection. Moments will happen in your life where you sin against God. They will happen because you're human. But there will be new patterns. Get your pen out. Here we go. 1 John 3, 6 through 9. No one who abides in him, circle this, keeps on sinning. Don't fool yourself. But he's not talking about moments. He's going give to give you a word in a minute to help you here. He's talking about patterns. Look, no one who, there it is again, who keeps on sinning, circle it, has either seen him or known him. So what, this is huge what he's saying. Verse 7, he warns you little children. So I love how he talks to us. He was an old guy at this point, and I love how he's like patting us on the head. Oh, little 50-year-old children, you know, 40-year-old. Isn't it great? Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever, and here's the word, practices, circle it. Now he's explaining to you. Because when you hear who keeps on sinning, we all go, I have. He's not talking about your bad moments. He's talking about your practices, your patterns. Whoever practices righteousness is righteousness as he is right. So there's new patterns that happen for a Christian. But watch this, verse 8. But whoever makes a practice of sinning, there it is. If your pattern is sinning, if your default mode is sinning, You're of the devil. I love how he doesn't mince words. He doesn't say, you're lost. He's like, you're of the devil. Maybe I should start preaching that way. We'll have lots of room at Three Circle then. (laughs) For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes, here it is again, it's a pattern, a practice of sinning. For God, watch, for God's seed, if you're a Christian, abides in you, the testimony, he cannot, I love that word, he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. In other words, if you're a real Christian, you will have bad moments, but you will have a new pattern, and that pattern will be clear. It'll be clear. And so he doesn't want this to confuse you. Look, practice, that word means pattern. And patterns are more important than moments. Now, this is not to give you permission. This is not easy grace. This is not permission to sin. It is an acknowledgement, though, that we do and will because we're fighting the flesh, right? So we humbly, though, begin to look for the road sign. Here's the question. What is the overall pattern of my life, and has that changed? Now, if you have become, if you believe theologically these things about Jesus, the Bible says you, you cannot keep on practicing sin. You will less and less have a pattern of sin in your life. Your moments of sin will become further and further apart. Does that make sense? You'll become more and more like Jesus. You'll have more and more victory over it. You'll have more and more power over your sin. That's how it works. And he's trying to tell you, he's like, don't deceive yourself. 
If you've tipped your hat, yeah, like Jesus, there's no change in your life. He's like, you're, you're not on the road, man. He makes it clear. No one can keep on sinning who's been born of God. You can't. There's a new nature in you, and thank God your new nature is stronger than your old. In fact, your new nature is slowly strangling out the old, right? Putting it on a cross every day. That's what's happening. Thank God. How many of you have seen that slow victory in your life? And one day you wake up and you go, you know what? That's not a problem for me anymore. That thing that used to be over my head is now under my feet in Jesus. And we thank God for that. That happens for real Christians. 1 John 3, 24, another one that keeps it real clear for us. Whoever keeps his commands abides in God. It doesn't mean you keep them perfectly, but that's your new pattern. And by this we know. By this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And the last one, road sign I want to give you today, is social. The last road sign that tells you, am I really a Christian? Can I, can I sleep tonight with that confidence that God wants me to have? Look around and see, do you love other believers in particular? You will love people more, but it, but it starts with a love for other brothers and sisters. Look what he says, 1 John three fourteen. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. We love our church family. We love the family of God. Something happens in us. He says, whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That's what Jesus said. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So we know, you can know when you begin to love other believers. Now that's important because like when you come to a local church just like this one, just like all of our campuses, we're all different. We all make different amounts of money. We all like different hobbies. Like most other things in your life are what we call affinity type groups. Your kids all play ball together, or y'all like the same thing, or maybe you all like to go watch movies, you all like to play frisbee golf, or you got a hunting club, you got, you got some couples that like to do their thing, but not the church. The church, listen, makes no sense. That's why it's so miraculous that God just save, save, saves, and builds his family. We're from different backgrounds and races. And then what happens is we begin to love each other. Like, have you ever met someone and you just know, and you're like, you're a Christian, aren't you? <laughs> you weirdo. I am too. <laughs> Boy, we're weird, aren't we? You just feel it. You sense it. You just sense it. And you immediately are like, man, I, you don't even know their name. You ever had that happen? I've gone to doctors before and the person at the counter, and I start talking to them, we, we realize we're, we're brothers, aren't we? We're, we're brother and sister, aren't we? Yep. Where do you go to church? Start talking about Jesus, and you're just like, I don't know you, but I love you. I don't know you, but man, because the cross is a connection that we all share that's really greater than anything, isn't it? And, and so John says that's a road sign. It's one of the final ones. Do we love one another? We can have assurance if we have love and affection for other believers. We can. He goes on in 1 John 4, 20 to 21, the last passage we'll look at. If anyone says, I love God but hates his brother, he's a liar. Now, John was known as the loving apostle, and he's still bringing the heat. That sounds like something Paul or Peter would say, but John's like, no, no, you're, 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 not, you're not for real. He says, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him, Jesus, whoever loves God must also love his brothers, his sisters. My hope is today, I, I got to trust in the power of the word. I hope if you're a Christian that you see these road signs. But if you don't, I'm begging you, don't deceive yourself. Give your life to Jesus, this Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, so that you see the road signs. But if you see those road signs, take joy, have confidence. You don't even have to be afraid of death because you see those road signs. Just enjoy the ride. You're on the right road. And pursue them. This is what they look like. Remember, in Atlanta, I looked for them everywhere. Can you see the road signs of the Christian faith in your life? They're there if you're really a Christian. They're there. Celebrate them. If you don't see them, repent and believe upon Jesus. 
Let me pray for you today. Jesus, thank you for your word, your grace. Thank you for wanting us to have assurance. You don't want us to be insecure. And I pray that we would have it today in you, in Jesus' name.